Well, my name is Tim Benjamin, and I live in the United States, and I've been involved with Hex since day one. And since then, I pretty much do what I can to help promote Hex among people who are not familiar with cryptocurrency. And I just do my best to educate them and onboard them. Uh, I don't hold an official position within the Hex ecosystem. You know, I'm not employed. I don't have a title, but that's essentially what I do is just do what I can as an individual to just help promote the product and onboard new users. Okay, great. Um, can you take us back to that time when you first heard of Hex? Yes. Uh, I first heard of Hex when Richard Hart first started talking about it in, I think it was early 2018, right after uh, Bitcoin started to enter into its bear market. Uh, Richard started talking about why that was happening and what could possibly be done about it. And that is when he started talking about a new product. I've known Richard since 2017. So um, I was already acquainted with him through, through his web, through Twitter and stuff. I don't know him personally, but so I've known about since its inception. Okay. And um, we, we, we'll, we'll dive straight in. The, Coin market cap lawsuit. Um, yes. You're, 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 you. It was suggested that I speak to you um, because you have some, some information that others do not have. So I wonder if you could talk on that just for, uh, for us and, and bring us up to speed on what what the motivation is there, the the hope, hopeful outcome. Okay. Well. I was not the person who came up with the idea of filing a lawsuit. That was another Hex user. And what happened is uh, another Hex user brought that person in contact with an attorney. And that attorney recommended that we file this case in either the state of Arizona, Texas, or Florida. And that person who knew the attorney contacted me because he thought I would be an ideal representative for the class in a class action lawsuit. So that's how I got involved. Um, the fact is, it turns out that I don't have any experience with trading. And our case uh, focuses on trading. So I ended up referring a friend of mine here to be the actual uh representative of the class in the class action lawsuit. And my role since then has been more of a public relations person. Um, but the fact is I haven't been given any update on the progress of the case other than it has been filed here in the state of Arizona. And we're waiting on a court date and we're also coin market cap is still, I believe within their period to assemble a legal team to respond to the lawsuit. So until, until the court gives us a court date, there's really no more information as far as the status of the case itself, other than what has been made public in the court briefing that we filed. Right, okay, so it's, it's early days still. Yes. And there hasn't been any public response from, um, from CoinMarketCap. As far no, not that I, I, I Actually, I recall, a few weeks ago, there was some <laughs> some debacle on Twitter's where an intern posted something on, uh, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what, if that was related, but yeah, yeah, it was some kind of meme. I don't know what their point was in posting it. Yeah, I'm not even sure like how that came. I, I followed it briefly for the day, and I was yeah, I didn't really understand where it come from. So, but uh, okay. We'll move on. Why does Nomix um, have Hex at third third place? I think Etherscan also, but yes. none of the other aggregators. Right. Um, Nomix is including all of the existing Hex tokens as part of the circulating supply. Uh, within Hex, there are some accounts that are associated with something called the origin address that is holding a very large liquid supply. And Nomics is counting that as part of the circulating supply because 
those coins can move if the holders of those accounts want them to move. Coin market cap and coin gecko, as far as I know, they're not allowing those particular tokens to be counted as part of the circulating supply for whatever reason they want to use. I don't know their specific reasons, but to the best of my knowledge, that's the situation. Uh, Richard Hart, he often tells people not to trade. Um, so, a, yes, yeah, he often, you know, tries to have people avoid it. But what? So why is the hex price so frequently talked about on uh, on live streams and online and what have you? That there's a lot of conversation around the price when, sure, I understood it to be irrelevant. So, well. I wouldn't say the price is irrelevant because we do want the price to appreciate just like anybody who owns a commodity. Um, our focus with price increase has more to do with the liquidity on exchanges rather than encouraging people to trade. So if people buy HEX and they stake it, that removes that, that lowers the circulating supply, which means there's less available to the public, which in turn would create buying pressure, which would push up the price. And that, that is our goal, is for the price to go up. But we would encourage people to buy HEX, stake it so they can earn yield on it, rather than trade it and gamble with it and risk a loss. So that's the primary difference with the price. Okay, understood. Uh, talk on the reliance on Ethereum for HEX right now. Obviously, Pulse is coming um, coming out later yeah. on in the year, but that connection, you know, Ethereum is obviously the but often the butt of the jokes around unstaking and staking, etc. So, just talk on the reliance on Ethereum and how that's uh, pushed Richard to come out with Pulse. Well, when HEX was first launched or con being conceived of, Richard was speculating on his live streams about where the HEX contract will live, what, what blockchain would provide the infrastructure. And he eventually went with Ethereum and he presented his reasons why. And so that's, that's how HEX ended up on Ethereum. And when HEX first launched, transaction fees were pennies. I, I remember paying 10 cents for a transaction fee and complaining to my one friend about how the fees were going through the roof because they were 10 cents. <laughs> and, you know, since then, because of NFTs and other sources of popularity, Ethereum, you know, if you want to get your transaction done within a reasonable amount of time, you have to pay to get ahead in the line. So that in itself has created a need for us to come up with an alternative if we don't want to be gouged with transaction fees. And that is what led into the development of the Pulse chain. And, you know, we got the test net up and running. So it's, it's a go ahead. It's, it's inevitable that Pulse will launch. And even with that, Richard has said publicly that he's not doing this out of spite for Vitalik. Richard respects Vitalik and he, you know, he wants the HEX contract that is still on the Ethereum blockchain to succeed. He wants Ethereum to succeed. He, you know, he's, he's not an, an enemy. But at the same time, for those of us who are in HEX, who want to onboard people who do not have hundreds of dollars to pay transaction fees, we need an alternative. And this is where Pulse comes in. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I understand Pulse um, will... Will improve will improve on Ethereum by increasing the through the the throughput fundamentally, yeah, it'll, right? It'll, it'll take some of the demand away from Ethereum, so they can just catch up on their mempool. If nothing, um, okay. The rely uh, <clears throat> my my next question: uh, Pulse chain expect yeah. expectations. Well, for me personally. Honestly, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to Pulse Chain when it was being talked about and when the chat rooms are being put together. I spent very little time paying attention to it until recently, mainly because I was just doing so well with Hex that even with the horrible fees, it wasn't killing me. But, um, you know, what I see with Pulse is a new infrastructure for smart contracts to live on. 
including Hex. There's going to be a mirror copy of everything on Ethereum. It's going to be copied over onto the Pulse chain. So everything's going to have a, a new platform to operate on. And, um, you know, for me personally, uh, I did enter into what was called the sacrifice phase, which was an opportunity to put money aside without any expectation, but that would be a benefit for when the pet pulse chain launches and the native token becomes available. There will be an opportunity there to benefit from that. I don't know the specifics on it right now because it was a sacrifice. Um, so, you know, I did uh, submit some funds for sacrifice. Was, was that in Hex? Was that sacrifice uh, in Hex? No, actually, I, I think I did USDC, if I remember correctly. Actually, it was a little bit of, it was some Hex, it was in USDC and also something called One Inch Token. Um, I sacrificed uh, some of that that I had acquired and... Uh, personally, I just want to see Pulse Chain function. That, that's all I expect is it for be a, to be a functional product. Um, you know, I did put some money into the sacrifice chamber and whatever, you know, benefit I get from that, I'll just be happy with it. But as long as the product actually works, I'm good. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, talk to me about Big Payday. Okay. <laughs> Big Payday occurred uh, last fall in November, and it was part of the original Hex contract. It wasn't something that happened impromptu. Uh, Big Payday, when Hex was first formulated, it was designed to benefit Bitcoin holders by allowing them to claim free Hex. Uh, and it was a fairly simple process. I had some Bitcoin. I did the, I did the steps. You know, it wasn't a compromise of my security, like some of the rumors were saying. And um, during that first year, people who had Bitcoin could claim free hex. When that first year was over, all of the unclaimed hex was distributed to people who were staked. So basically all the Bitcoin holders who neglected to claim their free hex, they lost it and it got distributed to the stakers. And that was basically big payday. Do all crypto scams boil down to whether they have a king or not? So whether they are decentralized or not, you know? I don't, I don't believe so. Um, because even if you have something that is centralized, if the central figure um, isn't a crook and is an honest person, then it will work. So I don't consider that the primary definition of something being a scam. To me, I would define a scam as something that does not function the way it was designed or the way it is promoted. In other words, you know, I have product, you know, I have this product and it does this, this, and this. If it doesn't do those things, then it's a scam. It's not being honest. Uh, to me, that, that's really it. All the technical stuff like centralization or admin keys, you know, those things, yes, they could be used to rob people. And if they are used in that way, then yes, that, that thing suddenly does become a scam but it doesn't automatically in my mind define it as a scam yeah i guess um <clears throat> like decentralization comes up a lot obviously in this uh, industry and and i, I sure. can't help but think that this is kind of the crux of the argument that the that it that it's not a scam until it is kind of thing you know it has the potential but then you could apply this logic to you know almost any product or service you know not only in crypto but i think that's you know <clears throat> that's been one of the defining features for hex over the year over the couple of years that it has existed is you know richard's at the center of it and i can't help but think i i imagine that he wish he had done a satoshi and you know <laughs> just vanished or 
never put himself in the front in the, in the limelight. Well, um, you know, Richard as a public figure, you know, is the face of Hex. You know, he's the guy who came up with the idea. Um, but at the same time, you know, he talks about how the fact there's no admin key. It's an immutable contract. It lives in the Ethereum blockchain. So there's nothing that Richard can do to affect my account because I hold my private key. So as long as I hold my private key, nobody's going to take my hex if I don't give it to them. So in that regard, it doesn't bother me that Richard is perceived as a central authority. That, that doesn't bother me at all just because of my relationship with Richard. And even if Satoshi was a public figure, that never would have changed my perception or my relationship to Bitcoin. To me, that that's irrelevant. You know, being someone who was born and raised in the United States, we have this we have this maxim associated with our judicial system that says that everybody's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. And I. I give that regard to everybody in the whole world. I give it to you. I give it to Richard. I give it to Vitalik, you know, Roger Ver, Peter McCormick. Everybody's innocent until proven guilty. And based on my knowledge of how Hex operates, you know, it, it doesn't bother me that Richard is perceived as a central authority because I know that I hold my private keys and everybody that I've onboarded, they all hold their private keys. So I have no reservations about the the security model of Hex, despite Richard's involvement in it. What what is a God Whale? The God Whale is somebody who was involved with Ethereum. They they are part of they were like the one of the first Ethereum miners. It's like they got Ethereum tokens directly like right off the bat. And on April 18th of 2000, uh, that individual made a substantial market buy of Hex. And I think they like doubled the price that day. And if you look at the price chart, we never fell back down below that level of that green candle that that well initiated by that purchase. So that individual, whoever holds that account, inherited the nickname of the God Whale just because of their action in that purchase and the effect that that's had on Hex. That's, that, that is the, the, the essence of the God Whale. And as I understand it, he has also done some more purchasing in the past couple of weeks, but I haven't done the chain analysis myself to know that for a fact. And okay, and he is a. It's a. We're saying it's a he, but it could be a she, right? Yeah. Okay. And um, are there are there more than one, or is there just just the one? There's been a couple of substantial buys that I've noticed over the year. Um, there, there's a bot on Twitter called Hex Whale Bot that publishes larger purchases of like six figures or more. So I get those notices all the time. Um, but there, there have been a couple of large buys where people have bought a si significant number of hex and staked it for the maximum length of five, 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 five days. Um, but I haven't noticed like I haven't noticed like a ten million dollar buy. You know, that's that's a big whale buy. I haven't noticed one of those yet because when one of those comes down the pike, I think we're going to see another one of those giant green candles on the price chart. Furus, what are they? <laughs> a fake guru. That That's a term that somebody came up with. It, I've heard it kicked around on different live streams and stuff. I had to ask myself what a furu is i kind of guessed it was a fake guru and i turned out to be right but i did have to ask <laughs> who else should i talk with uh, in your can you get can you lead me on to anybody else that's worth yes there's a man named wales only that's his twitter handle he's the guy i think who came up with the term fake guru uh he functions anonymously online uh so he won't show his face if you interview him uh, 
apparently he works on Wall Street. He lives in New York. Uh, I have met him in person. Uh, great guy, very knowledgeable of markets and finance in general. Uh, he goes online regularly and posts diagrams regarding all kinds of financial data uh, as it relates to hacks and markets. So I would definitely recommend him. Um, if you want more information on the lawsuit, there's a man who goes by the name of Johnny Chaos on Twitter. I believe his Twitter handle is CCFX Studios. I've been speaking, uh, I was speaking to him last night actually on Twitter. Okay. He's the guy who came up with the idea of pursuing the lawsuit. That, that was his idea. And then I, I got brought into it later. Uh, another person you might be interested in interviewing is a guy named Seth Mendoza. That's the Twitter handle he goes by. Uh, he is the man who put Johnny in touch with the attorney. And he's also very, he's a younger guy, very knowledgeable. Um, that's not his real name. Uh, that's just a name that he goes by online. He's rather anonymous himself. Um, but he is involved in a project called Make a Difference, which has something to do with clean energy. And I think it has something, he's going to bring Hex into it somehow. I don't know anything about the details of it, but... Um, He's a very young, he's an inventive, intelligent young guy, I would say. Um, he's definitely worth interviewing. Um, those are probably the top three people that I would recommend as far as people who are involved, innovative, you know, doing something type of people. Perfect. Thanks very much. I um, I have... Yeah, I have about nine interviews with with Hexkins over the next week. Um, but now I, the last few interviews, I've just added another ten or something to. It. So I got plenty of people to talk to. But um, okay, Timothy. So let's wrap this up. Is there anything? Sure. Is there anything that you want to touch on while I got everything? <clears throat> while I got the cameras rolling and what have you? Um, something that you yeah. that I might have missed. Yeah, I'd like to touch on the subject of maximalism. Because I've never heard that word until I got involved in crypto. And I've been in crypto since 2011. Uh, I learned about Bitcoin way back when. And um, I didn't, the term maximalism did not start to enter the space until, if I remember correctly, until like a year, at least a year or two after the fact. And that's because there were no, I mean, there were altcoins that, came into existence almost from the get-go because Charlie Lee started forking Bitcoin right away. Uh, Litecoin came out in 2000, I think it was already in existence by 2011. But this concept of maximalism didn't come until after that. And I considered myself a wannabe Bitcoin maximalist. But the fact is, I never could go there in my mind because I wasn't a miner. I just didn't have the hardware necessary to get involved in mining. Even back in 2011, I just didn't have the money to buy video cards. And um, so I couldn't compete. And so in that sense, I never could really go all the way with the whole maximalist mindset because I wasn't actually producing the thing that I was so into. And to me... You know, if Elon Musk was a Tesla, Tesla maximalist, that would make sense because he owns the company and he's building the product. But for me, if I'm not producing Bitcoin, I don't have a real reason to be a maximalist. So these people who go online with this arrogant attitude that Bitcoin is the only legitimate crypto if they're not producing it, they really don't have a leg to stand on. And it turns that attitude into a turnoff. And this is what has resulted in us hexagons coming up with terms like furu and coming against these people because they came against us first. Hex was designed to benefit Bitcoin people. And, you know, we didn't come out of the gate swinging fists and coming against people and saying, you all suck because you're not in hex. Nobody had that attitude. 
at the beginning. And I don't even know very many people that have that attitude now because we do not have a chip on our shoulder. You know, people would say, well, you're hex maximalists. Well, yeah, I'm fully invested in hex. And yes, I'm involved in producing it as a staker, but I'm not coming against other people saying you all suck because you're not in hex. You know, so this whole maximalist attitude, I think really people need to just take a look at themselves and be honest with why they're doing what they're doing. I believe Hex is a net benefit for the whole world. And that's why I promote it. And that's why I'm into it. And that's why I defend it against people who would say that it's not a net benefit. It's a scam. It's a negative. Well, you know, I'm going to tell them, no, they're not. And I'm going to confront them with facts, not with attitude. So I, I would like to see more of the crypto space operate that way. Come at people with facts, not with attitude. That's what I would like to see for the whole crypto space. Because like I said, I was involved with Bitcoin from the very beginning. There are other cryptos that I, along the way, was very supportive of. And even now, I'm not opposed to. So that's it. That's where that's something that I would like to see addressed within the crypto space. And if you, you know, if you incorporate that in your documentary, I would like to see you to address that subject, too, because as crypto, we do have one common goal, and that is to provide the world with something better than institutionalized systems of fiat, like the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, the Bank of International Settlements, all these institutions where the people outside of those institutions do not have a voice in how those institutions operate. You know, when America first started, the Constitution said that Congress had the power to coin money and to regulate the value thereof. Well, Congress are just elected representatives, which meant the American people had a voice in economic policy prior to the Federal Reserve taking over as the Central Bank of America. Now, Americans don't have a voice in economic policy. The Federal Reserve Board does. And this is why when I heard about Bitcoin, I was so gung-ho because I was already mentally prepared for something like Bitcoin to come into existence. It's just Satoshi invented it instead of me is really what it came down to. And I feel the same way about Hex. Richard invented it instead of me, but it's still something that I wanted to see come into existence. Okay. So, no, I appreciate you sharing, sharing that. And I think you, you know, when you say... You know, my investigation is obviously unfolding online at the same time, and I have had a bit of a bit of a dilemma getting hold of the oppo opposition, if you like. So, sure. and I, you know, it seems to be chalk chalking up to the fact that they are Mac uh, Bitcoin maxis, as you say. So, yeah. I am uh, I'm confident that that <clears throat> that topic of conversation will feature in the film. So. But um, let's wrap it up there then, Timothy, because I actually have a, another uh, meeting sure. coming up very shortly. And also the, the Zoom here says that it's, it's running out of time. Okay, so whatever you want to say in closing, uh, I'm pretty much done. Yeah, and same here. I, I think I have everything that, yeah, I have plenty. And I mean, this, this project's going to unfold over the next year. Maybe I, sure. can, maybe I can sync up with you again. Uh, sometime I'd next year to. I'd love to it was very enjoyable talking to you perfect thanks very much then Timothy let's uh, let's wrap it up there and uh, I'll uh, yeah we'll take it on the Twitter Twitters from now on <laughs>